Chimir is a distant planet. Although much larger than Earth, it is much like our home, being within a habitable zone of its star, having a single large moon, being of similar composition save for a fairly low density core, and spinning prograde with a spicy axial tilt. The life forms of Chimir are predominantly descended from Earth flora and fauna set free to evolve independently in this new, grand context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies of them on Chimir. As the asteroid that ended the age of dinosaurs 66 million years ago never struck Chimir, dinosaurs have continued to be the dominant terrestrial megafauna. In addition to dinosaurs, many recent harvests have collected a wide range of animals much more familiar to us, including lions, horses, and humans. Even the mightiest of dynasties are defined by their context. No organism is stronger than their setting. Changes to the climate in the known world are the primary drive of most extinction events, and the subsequent harvests the Great Portal seeks to restore a healthy territory, which it determines by the biodiversity and biomass of its flora and fauna. As climate influences the biomes these organisms call home, as does the placement of continents, wind and water currents, and global temperatures, I was elated to get this as a sponsored topic. It has proven helpful as I am working on my next anthology, which has an aquatic theme and naturally involves a lot of sailing and knowledge of where the winds of Chimere blow. I'm nowhere close to an expert on the matter, so this episode required a lot of study. To begin, we're going to need to look at the full map of the planet, since the known world is situated between the equator and the southern subtropical high latitudes, or horse latitudes. Horse latitudes are so called because this is a region where winds are stagnant due to the warm air being drawn poleward to the westerlies and cool air north to the trade winds, and wind-powered ships in our own history would become caught still, so they would sometimes throw their horses and any expendable items on the ship to lighten the load. The currents bringing warm or cold water is also dictated by the size and shape of the planet, along with the location of the tectonic plates below sea level. Although Chimere is much larger than Earth, the principles dictating wind and water currents are the same. As we zoom in, we see that the subtropical high latitude cuts through the known world, specifically along southern Arvel and across the inland sea, through the mouth of the Crescent Sea out into the abyss. The equator is to the far north, almost double the distance of the entire map usually designated as the known world. This is a significant aspect of the direction, strength, and temperature of the winds, but it isn't the only factor. Continents also influence wind as do water currents. Wind passing over cold water brings cooler air and often brings with them a degree of aridity, while winds traveling over warm water often contain hot, human air to bring inland. This map demonstrates the wind and water currents of the known world. Warm currents with an inland wind are the most productive habitats, such as the Titan Gardens of northwestern Arvel and the northern jungles of Nikar, while the most desolate regions are those with cold currents and offshore winds, like the Arveleth coast, the interior of Nikar, and southern Picardia. Normally, the inland sea is quite warm, with tropical waters coming in from the north and cycling through to provide necessary waters to make the surrounding coastlines lush. However, during the summer months, offshore winds trigger upwells, and cold, nutrient-rich waters are pushed through the northern channel between Picardy and the Free States. This surge of cold water cycles through the inland sea, bringing plenty all the way to the northern Gulf Sea. Many animals gather annually to take advantage of this smorgasbord, as do fishermen along the coastal settlements. While laying out this biome map, I utilized the Copan Climate Classification System. It wasn't perfect since many ecosystems in Chimere, notably Titan Gardens, don't have close analogs on Earth today, but overall I found it was useful in putting these general biomes into a more comprehensive context. First up, we have the tropical rainforests in dark blue, generally dense habitats 
with poor soil quality and high biodiversity. This sort of habitat does not appeal to titanosaurs, especially adults, as the soil is often damp, the foliage not to their liking, and the space too limited to be worth tending. Juvenile titans often take up residence and shelter in these denser jungles, but don't remain there for long. It is here that mammals and reptiles like snakes and lizard are at their most biodiverse. The next habitat we'll discuss is the savanna or tropical grasslands in light blue. The most famous grassland habitat in Chimer is the Housy Prairie, having low biodiversity, especially low floral biodiversity due to the aggressive competition of housy grass. Other grasslands do exist in Chimer, but they are not particularly common. A fern prairie, a relic of a habitat once common during the Tyrant Dynasty, extends along the northwestern coast of Arvel. Hot steppes and gold aren't terribly dissimilar from savannas, but tend to be more arid. In Chimere, this more arid habitat is a lot more common than grasslands. Grasses are still quite common in this habitat, although it's not nearly as productive. The poleward side of the Arveleth Mountains is generally a steppe habitat. Called the Cold Highlands of Arvel by Chimerans in the known world, it may be colder due to the absence of winds and colder waters, especially in its northern range, but it's still a temperate habitat. This is not a productive habitat by any means. In Nikar, the hot steppes are consumed by the northern reaches of the Housy Prairie. True deserts are quite rare in the known world. The western reaches of the Housy Prairie is arguably desert, but the Housy grass is so resilient and well adapted to hot, arid climates that it covers much of what might otherwise be dunes. To the western most reaches of Arvel, a vast desert spans almost 2,000 miles before it reaches the coast. These dunes are generally desolate, but a few times a year, a tropical or temperate storm will break through the barriers of the winds and water currents, turning this habitat into a verdant scrubland. Animals here are hardy and used to make the most of this rare bounty. The most abundant terrestrial biome in Chimere is the tropical monsoon habitat. This habitat is warm year-round, with a dramatic fluctuation between wet and dry seasons. It is here that titanosaurs and their gymnosperm gardens flourish. During the rainy season, the habitat might become wetter than they prefer, but the water is quickly diverted to the rivers or consumed by flora. A majority of Housy Prairie in the known world is technically in the tropical monsoon habitat. For most of the year, this region is hot and arid, perfect for Housy grass. A gap in the eastern mountains opens the interior to warm weather currents and an abundance of storms. This pummels the region with an obscene amount of water for several months. During this time, much of the prairie becomes saturated, and places becoming shallow wetlands spanning for miles. Much of it gets into the mountains to the north, where it rolls downstream and flows into the slow-moving seretic wetlands that feed into the Crescent Sea. The seretic wetlands flow throughout the year, maintained by mountain rivers and a very gradual slope, but these annual storms provide the foundation of its most abundant months. The west coast of Arvel has regions that benefit from seasonal reversal of the wind directions, pummeling its coast with enough rain to support a few forests. That does it for tropical regions, or the Hadley Cell. Now we move on to the temperate zone. Although a humid continental climate is quite common in this zone on Earth today, it is not present in the known world since the only temperate zones are peninsulas and islands. There are four temperate biomes found in Kajar, the southern islands and free states, and Picardia. Where cold currents and offshore winds occur, a Mediterranean climate is abundant, here represented in yellow. Without much rainfall, hardier vegetation, sparse mosaic forests, and scrublands dominate. Summers are hot and dry, and their winters are some of the coldest in the known world. A lot of the grains grown in this habitat are resilient and last for many years, making them strong agricultural centers. 
Parallel to these habitats, usually near warm currents, is the humid subtropical climate. This region has high precipitation in the summer months and mild winters. Soil isn't as nutritious in this biome as the Mediterranean climates, but as a whole new sort of crops have been grown here. This combination of Mediterranean and humid subtropical climates in most of the southern islands, free states, and Qajar, combined with cool waters with abundant fish stocks, is how these regions have supported such a high population of Chimerans, especially considering these regions are much more appealing to people than some of the more dangerous fauna of the known world. Next is the oceanic climate, the most common biome in Picardia north of its mountain range, although it is also found in some of the southern islands. This biome has warm summers and cool winters, not too extreme on either end, and is raining pretty much all of the time. Most of the southern coast of Picardia is arguably temperate rainforest, although the cold currents that come every summer often end up drying out some of the region although rainwater from the Great Lakes balances things out, and northern Picardia almost never experiences drought. Southern Picardia is much more arid Mediterranean climate, but for the most part, Picardia is a fairly stable temperature and reliable precipitation. This humid climate means that the resident species of Titanosaur, the Girazhent, tend to avoid lowland habitats. Lowlands are where the Picardian Confederacy is concentrated. This isn't directly because of the minimal number of titans, although having fewer 20-ton dinosaurs constantly needing to push over your walls to eat your crops is definitely a boon to permanent settlement. Last month, one of my previous sponsors, Medium D Speaks, recommended that I check out the channel Artifexian by Edgar. Edgar has a phenomenal catalog of videos that offer concise explanation to a wide range of topics regarding world building, from languages and geography to climate and solar systems. In addition to digging out a few books from college and referencing articles I've saved over the years, several of Edgar's videos proved especially useful to me, and I've linked below the ones that I found most helpful. If you've been excited by anything that I've discussed today and want to know more, Chances are, Edgar has an episode on it. Thank you so much to Maya and Connor for co-sponsoring this episode. As I'm working on the anthology largely focused on seafaring, I have already started working on the wind and water currents, and the biomes of course had an impact on the flora and fauna of this developing project. Huge shout out to my patrons. As I'm barreling towards this anthology's publication date, which I am shooting for an October release, it is super helpful to have the support to supplement sponsorships, commissions, and YouTube revenue. Thank you all for watching this, and please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing, and commenting since it helps to get my videos into new hands. That's enough for today. On Sunday we will have a special episode on the GLaDOS, and next week we will be letting the dogs out and discussing domesticated canids of Chimere. Until next time, stay fantastic. Cheers, folks.